Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. All right, take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew 23. We're going to look at the last four woes, which I shouldn't probably do. We we probably should look at each woe by itself. Each one of these is is a sermon unto itself. So So far in this chapter, we've been devoted to debunking the Pharisees, or at least Jesus has. He's started there in 23, 1 or actually in 2, 23 verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. So the entire chapter has been devoted to, what is it about these guys that call themselves Pharisees that's kind of, it's different, it's not what Jesus taught. And they were always, you know, those two groups were always at odds with one another. We come to the, the final part of the woes in this chapter. So let's just read, we'll, I'll read each woe and then make my comment and then read the next woe and read the comment and read my comments there so first of all verse 23 woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law justice mercy and faithfulness but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others you blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe. Now, we understand tithing. Tithing meant to take a tenth and to give that to the Lord. And so you'll notice when Jesus says, you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. That would take a microscope to tithe exactly mint, anise, and cumin. Because if you're trying to make sure that you're giving a tenth of something, it would need close inspection of spices this tiny to make sure that you had it exactly right. Uh, That's what they were doing. They were examining with a microscope their spice cupboard (laughs) so that they could tithe to, to the Lord out of their spices. And then Jesus says, and have omitted the weightier matters of judgment, mercy, and faith. Do you notice how we have three spices mentioned? Mint, anise, cumin. And then Jesus mentions weightier matters, and there are three. Judgment, mercy, faith. So they majored on the minors, and they were slack on the majors. It's not that they didn't understand judgment, mercy, faith. I mean, they were, they were religious men, so these were not terms that were that they were ignorant of, nor were they unfamiliar with them, nor were they strangers to them. They, they got that, but they were so focused on the minor things, on separating out the anise into tenths and the cumin into tenths that they forgot that they should have been dispensing judgment, mercy, faith. Now, Jesus doesn't give them a break on this count either. Notice what he says. These ye ought to have done and not to ha- leave the other undone. So he doesn't upbraid them for tithing the mint, anise, and cumin. That's not a bad thing. That takes a very precise faith to do that as long as the other's in place. But you see, they had it so out of kilter that they were majoring on this little thing while they were ignoring the thing that they should have been majoring on, mercy, judgment, or judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, and not to have left the other undone. Now, notice verse 24. Ye blind guides, which strain at an ad and swallow a camel. Have you ever heard anybody say that? We use that all the time, don't we? This is a, this is a uh, common saying anymore, right, in English parlance. We, or at least it used to be. I'm not, I don't know about any more, but I can remember growing up hearing people talk like that, strain in an ant and swallow a camel, which means you worry over rules and regulations, and yet you easily allow for great crimes. Imagine the, imagine the police officer that was 
concerned about the uh, condition of your license plate. And yet the person committing vehicular homicide, he just let them go. But he's worried about your license plate. All right, so that's straining in an at and swallowing a camel, which is what these guys had done. They were measuring out the fine, the fine spices in their cupboard so they could tithe it. And yet they were, they were allowing judgment, mercy, faith to slide away. But, of course, this is, this is a hallmark of um, what, what, we, what would we call this? A hallmark of legalism, a hallmark of religiosity is when you do this, you get so focused on the little things that you forget the larger picture. People who, people who are KJV-only folks, I, I just use them for example because that's the first thing that comes to mind. They focus on that issue to the exclusion of everything else. You know, that becomes, that becomes their north star. Whenever we don't make much of Jesus and we make much of anything else, we have slipped off into some sort of religiosity that will eventually become toxic and kill our faith. Well, Jesus continues then in verse 25. We have the second woe. So the first woe is the woe about wrong judgment. They, they didn't know. They weren't judging rightly. The second, row, the second woe is about wrong holiness. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Interesting. So here we have an analogy, washing the dishes. Everybody washes dishes. I'm sure the Pharisees, when they went home and took their robes off, their wife said, the pots and the pans need doing, right? Even though they were somebody, when they walked out their door, inside their house, their wife would say, do the pots and the pans. So we all understand it. These guys understood it. Washing dishes is something that is common to the human experience back in the time of Christ. It still is today. We talk about this in, in you know, keeping house. It's part of what you do. But who among us would take a, a cup that had been filled with something that had been eaten, that had set out and perhaps dried or spoiled in the cup, and taken the cup and taken a wet rag and soapy and hot and washed the outside of the cup and then put the cup back up without washing the inside of the cup. Nobody would, except for the Pharisees, because he says you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter. So when washing the outside is always the last thing washed, not the first thing and the only thing. But they had made it a practice to wash the outside so that it looked good. But what does he say? Within they are full of. Now I want, to, I want him to say, you know, chicken bones and old barbecue sauce or something, right? I mean, something nasty. But he gets even nastier here. He says extortion and excess. So they're taking money. They're taking bribes. They look good doing it. But they're doing it. No one wants to eat from a dirty dish. And when you pull that cup down out of the cupboard and you look inside and it's nasty, your first reaction is, this needs to be washed, except for the Pharisees. Because they had made a living off of this. Looking like one thing, but having something else on the inside. This is backward. This is a failure of simple religion, which is based on performance. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which, was, that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside may be clean also. Religion, simple religion is based on performance, and that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They were doing good works so that they could look good, but they hadn't treated the inside, their insides. Their insides were still dirty while they were doing good things. There are a lot of people, even in Christendom today, who are so busy doing good things, they have not measured the filth in their hearts. They look good on the outside. They might sound good on the outside, but they've not dealt with the inside. They've not washed it out. This is the wrong kind of holiness. 
A holiness that is just external is never a holiness that will affect the soul and cleanse the heart. Jesus says, cleanse first that which was within the cup and platter, that the outside may be clean. Because when you, when you take care of the holiness on the inside, it radiates out. So there's a different quality to the cleansing that Jesus is talking about with this last statement than the one he mentioned at the beginning. The cleansing in this statement is that there's something that happens on the inside which affects the outside. What the Pharisees were doing was doing good things on the outside, but it never made its way in because they were the ones doing it. And any time you get involved in a simple religion that's based on good works, holiness is always external. It's always things done. It's always places gone to or not gone to, words spoken or not spoken, clothes worn or not worn, things, you know, whatever. We can just make a whole long list. And then we have beginning in verse 27, the third woe. This is wrong righteousness. So we have wrong judgment in 23 through 24, wrong holiness in 25 through 26, wrong righteousness beginning here in 27. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, For ye are likened to whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within, but are within, full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. First, notice that we have a similitude here. You are like unto. Now, we had sort of a similar similitude in, in 25, that is an analogy, the washing the dishes. But now he says, you are like. So he's comparing them to something else. Whited sepulchers, which are indeed beautiful outwardly. So we understand that. We've been there. We've seen that. You go to some place like um, the Tomb of the Unknowns. <clears throat> that is a moving experience. And you see that tomb, and it's beautifully ornate, and it's decorated, and maybe you go there after the president has been there on Memorial Day, and you see his wreath placed there in front of that grand tomb, and it's a, it's a moving experience. It's meant to be. It's a part of our national personality, you know, that, that whole thing. Uh, but notice what Jesus says, and he compares them to these kind of sepulchers. They're whited. They're beautiful. It's, a, it's something of honor. But he says, inside, what's in there? If it's a real sepulcher, what's in there? Bones. Death is in there. Are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even the grandest tomb is only grand on the outside. Because if it's a real tomb, the thing on the inside, you don't want to see. When I go to Grant's tomb or when I go to Lincoln's tomb or when I go to the Tomb of the Unknowns or when I go to whoever's tomb, Andrew Jackson's tomb down in Louisville, Kentucky, I don't want want anybody to open it up for me. I don't want to see what's inside. I know what's inside. These fellows apparently didn't know what was inside. He says, this is what you're like. You're like a beautiful tomb, but inside you're full of deadness, uncleanness. You don't want to touch it. And, of course, they understood this completely because to touch something dead was to be a ceremonially unclean for a time. And so they would never touch something that was dead. Jesus said, you're carrying around dead inside you. You're dead on the inside. You are unclean on the inside. You are not worthy to walk into that temple that you protect and worship the Lord. Verse 28, even so ye... Also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. They were dead because they were not cleansed of their unrighteousness, and so that led to their hypocrisy and iniquity. Now now we understand. We understand the woe when he calls them hypocrites. We understand that because the unrighteousness that was in them had led to this hypocrisy and the sin that they were sinning against God the Lord's Christ. And then the last of the four woes is here in verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous, and say, 
If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye will be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Well, Jesus is not trying to make friends here, is he? He is telling them the raw and honest truth. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. So this is the fourth one. We've had judgment, wrong judgment, wrong holiness, wrong righteousness, and now wrong justice. So they think they're doing a just thing by building the tombs of the prophets and garnishing the sepulchers of the righteous. You could go to Israel today and you can see some of the tombs that they would have built and garnished. Uh, tombs of Absalom, tomb of David, uh, the tomb of some of the kings. They're all still there. Some of them, most of them actually have been plundered. But they're beautiful, ornate. <clears throat> you look at them and wonder, you know. And so they were the, these were the ones that were done. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, at this period of time, especially at this period of time, being at the time of Herod, uh, they would have been a part of... Uh, elaborately ordaining or uh, or elaborately decorating these tombs. But you'll notice that Jesus says, you build the tombs of the prophets. Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. These are good works done from a 2020 perspective. Always in hindsight is that perspective. They could look in the past and say, well, our fathers treated those prophets wrongly. They persecuted them wrongly. Now we should do something about that. So their justice was a past tense justice. They're trying to make up for what their fathers had done. And you say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. This is easy to do, isn't it? It's easy to say, oh, I'd, I'd have never done that. I'd have stood with the prophet. I would have stood with Jeremiah. I would have stood with Amos. I would have stood with Hosea. I would have stood with Isaiah. I would have stood with these men who suffered so greatly because of their, uh, because of their work, their word. It's so easy to do that. Uh, and then speak ill the prophet that's in their midst. They didn't understand who Jesus was. They didn't get it. They didn't understand who John was. These were the last two. John was the final prophet of the Old Testament period, Jesus the Messiah. And yet they were speaking ill of them, doing exactly what their fathers did. They are behaving in the same way as those who went before them. And Jesus points that out. He says, wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Yeah, because they're behaving in the same way. Their behavior is exactly like their daddies. They are doing exactly the same thing. And Jesus, I'm sure, could reach all the way back to Elijah and Elisha and go even further back than that and say, these prophets are the ones that you have insulted and killed and murdered. And now I stand before you, and what are you going to do with me? And notice what he says next, because what he says next is what they're going to do to him. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Do you remember the, um, the, the parable that Jesus told about the landowner who, who built a vineyard, planted a vineyard, built a tower, dug a wine press, fenced it around, and then leased it out to, uh, to workers? you remember that parable? Okay, so when he says, fill up the measure of your fathers, that parable was a, a beautiful little vignette about the prophets because all these servants that the landowner sent, which the renters killed and, dis- and abused, are the prophets. And then the landowner says, I'll send my son, and they'll respect my son. And the landowner sends the son, and the renters say, here comes the heir, let's kill him and take what belongs to him. And when Jesus says, fill up then the measure of your fathers, he's saying, come on and do to me what you know you're going to do, And let's get it over with. Let's just get it over with. Fill up the measure of your fathers. They killed all those that my father sent. Now here the son is. Go ahead and let's finish it off. Fill it up. Let's be done. And then, (laughs) 
And then verse 33, he, he, puts, he twists the knife in the rib. He says, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Oh, he's, he's pushing the button, you know. Yeah, this is what you're going to do. Go ahead and do it. I dare you. Yeah. And they're going to. Why? Because of all the things that he says. Inside, they're dead. They're unclean. They've not experienced the cleansing that they should have. They make the outside of the cup clean, but the inside is full of deadness, extortion, excess. Why? Because they're looking at holiness through works, through the lens of works, rather than through the lens of the Spirit of God. And they have wrong judgment. They're focused on the wrong thing. They've not learned the law correctly, and so they've got it all backwards. They, they strain the net, and they swallow the camel. So all of this is setting us up, and we're approaching the passion. So we're getting close, and as we get closer, Jesus is doing his level best to make sure that these guys are going to play their part. Of course, he doesn't need to do a whole lot of inciting. They're ready anyway. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.